It's Lou Collins. Hi, uh, morning, James. Yes, uh, James good is here with me. On this morning, I know, though, I know. I'm not right. on form today at all. I don't even know what the date is. Monday. It's, yeah, I know it's Monday. What date is it? March. <laughs> the. It's 2012. It's March the 12th. Morning. Um, well, we've had a heavy shows the last few weeks, um, and I was hoping it would just calm down this week, but it clearly isn't going to be. I told you to get the uh, Teletubbies on, but you wouldn't listen. I know, would you? I, know I wouldn't listen. Um, yeah, it's been a lot focused around uh, Holly Gregg case, uh, which is is going great. They're well. Um, but today's show, we have Peter Reynolds, who is the leader of CLEAR, uh, Legalise Cannabis Alliance. Um, he's he's going to come in and have a chat with us, um, you know, and talk about cannabis and why it's illegal and the medicinal purposes and, um, you know, what help it does give to, to people who do need it on the, the medicinal side of things. Um, but before we start, we've got a few news articles we want to go through one that stuck that i i noticed in yesterday's observer ross charles have been appointed to advise the seven airlines which hold a 42 percent stake in the national air traffic uh, traffic services the investment bank is understood to have been hired on a defensive basis to safeguard the investments of the airline group so really to to oh, safeguard sure Rothschild's yeah. money, really. Well, the Rothschilds, they probably, you know, they have salesmen and they make cold calls just like everyone else. Yeah. And, you know, they, they send out and see if they can get piecework. They do. It's either that or, you know, they, they just want to control absolutely everything. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and then there's something in here, the relationships. Um, we've also got the relationship special again between Obama and Britain. So that's really, that's really good to know. Well, I'm, I'm glad. Are you? Yeah, because, you know... Um, I love Obama. He's he's like the royalty over in the states. Yeah, they've just sort of declared the Obama administration just came out and said last week that not only can they kill Americans on American soil on American soil without any sort of due process or anything Going via whatsoever. Congress. Now they don't um, need Congress. And now they can just, actually go fairy tale, aren't they? Yeah, and now they can actually go to a full blown war as well. So that's great. Without which is the nice. The people all oh, the without anyone. Yeah, you so, just decide to go and invade people. But people are still thinking they, they figure great. they figure that if you do some like nice um, touchy feely movies like Coney Twenty Twelve, then you can Coney Twenty Twelve. I haven't looked into it too much. Yeah, it was basically it you know uh, in in a lot of these um, a lot of nations around the world. Of course, great. There's great. Uh, atrocities going on yeah and um a video i i knew it was sort of a a bit of an agenda push last week because all of a sudden everybody everywhere was posting coney 2012 coney yeah. 20, and i was like okay what's going on coney was uh you know fighting the ugandan government uh he's not been actually in there for about nine years or was it seven years yeah. anyways quite a long time and the Ugandan government does the same thing where they, they round up kids and get them to fight in their wars. I mean, it, this is this is something up, that's been going guns. on for absolute, well, forever, as yeah. far as we can, you know, we know of. And our government's got no problem selling them weapons or anything. Um, but I guess uh, that that sort of push... Where, well, it's just the final thing. We've, do, we've done sort of, you know, the Middle East. Yeah, you know, Africa's next. But the thing is, what they're, doing, what they're doing at the moment, it's all... Um, it's all really slick uh, marketing to get the people, instead of saying, oh, weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons, weapons of mass destruction, terrorists all the time, they figured that if they put a thing on saying, oh, look, there's some people in danger or, you know, this dictator has shot someone, mm. they can make people on an emotional level be like, oh, yeah, you know, oh, Gaddafi shot at 30 civilians that were protesting. Yeah, let's go and bomb the crap out of the country for yeah. you know six months and that's the same story it's the same thing so you've got all they're these... working hard to get the agenda up and yeah, running well, they're doing a good you job know, and agenda 2012 it's all sort of coming together it's like one big push for obama to make yeah stance. and unfortunately people buy into it they you know you've got all these lefty liberals which are like oh yeah they used to be on my side of the thing was anti-war and now mm. it's let's go invade and, and and free some people by bombing them to death and it's like right that's sort of the opposite of what we really want to uh, achieve boys and girls and we've got no historical uh, track record of us going and bombing the freedom freedom out of anyone mm. that's actually worked out I don't think mm. I mean really let's face it this preemptive war business that we've been doing for about 50 or 60 years 
not worked out very not, well for, really for, the, for the, for the well average Joe, anyways. I Works was, out for military contractors. We've got so. Chris in the studio. Say hello, Chris. Hi. Chris has come in just to sit in and view what we're doing, friend of ours. Um, I so think he's else? taking notes. He's, uh, he is taking notes. Yeah, it's government. Oh, bloody hell. Um, we had a bit of good, good news from Sound Art, though, last week, because Sound Art let us come in here and rant every week. And uh, apparently we've got, we've got the highest number of listeners that Sound Art's had in a long time, so that's really positive. And they did ask me, people who are listening out online, if you're liking what they're doing, to hit the donate button to, um, to Sound Art. So that's my little bit of a plus so for Sound Art. So we don't their and servers to- again. Um, yeah, knock their servers off like we have been doing, which is great. Uh, what else is going on? A British General's company um, paid was paid £1.5 million to promote a dictatorship. Britain's former military commander in Iraq has extravagantly praised a dictatorial, dictatorial Arab regime after it paid his company £1.5 million to support its stance before the international community. I'd support them for £1.5 million. You'd do anything for £1.5 million. Yeah, don't you believe it. <laughs> um, but no, this is back to the same old thing. Uh, there's, a, there's a great movie people should check out. It's called uh, New American Century. Project for New American Century. Well, that's the... Oh, that's I think the, the actual movie is just called yeah, New yeah. American Century. Okay. It's based on, yeah, the white paper that the neocons um, came up with before 9-11. And um, it follows basically neocons and that sort of uh, military spending and the military-industrial complex, the banks and all this sort of thing, um, and, and the connections between the two. And uh, there's some quite telling um, reports in, in that film about the contractors in Iraq... Um, after the invasion, and basically the amount of money that was being printed in the states, um, bundled up, uh, I think it was in, in bundles of two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and just th- they would just basically load the banks yeah. in um, Iraq and then ship the um, the money out to to contractors, and uh, the amount of money that I think I forget how many billions went through it uh, for the Iraq War Fund going to private contractors with no checks and balances, people were walking out with $2.5, $3 million without even giving a receipt for what they were, you know, just crazy. The amount of money that is is just completely, completely wasted in in these wars, you know. I I got friends and family in the military and some of the the weapons, I mean, uh, um, somebody in my family was saying that, yeah, you know, you'd fire off a rocket like it but was nothing. But they have proper boots and it, to wear. They no, have no, that's the thing, because got, there's no, the, there's the kit, no money there's for no the special boots. interests no. in the, the boots and the body armour, obviously. Yeah. But you can spend like 600000 on a rocket and go blow something up and yeah. maybe kill an insurgent. Got, while we're on this, and saying oh. topical to what the show's going to be about, there hasn't been much on... I haven't seen much about Ron Paul. Um, I don't know how he's doing at the moment but I've got um, a video well a link to play in a minute with his um, stance on cannabis because while the American troops are, are being killed left right and centre there are American troops over the over in Afghanistan who are there to guard opium opium fields and I think it's already known that the it's it's jumped up a huge amount I think, the yeah, I think um, of Afghanistan at the moment was and what it was like pre the invasion of Afghanistan. Yeah, under the Taliban, I think it was about 2% of world production, and now it's something like 90% yeah. coming out of Afghanistan, yeah. just massive amounts. And uh, it's quite funny as well, because we're all, at, you know, war on drugs, war on drugs, we'll stop shipping it in then. Yeah. Um, I remember... It's big business, uh, isn't it? Russia Same a couple as of years ago. About the children, it's all big business. Yeah, and Russia a few years ago was like, right, then you know we'll carpet bomb all the poppy fields in Afghanistan. They yeah. said. I remember reading about it, and yeah. and the the uproar from the British and American uh, military and and government. Oh no, 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 no! Don't do that. And the Russians were like, well, we, if it's a problem, we'll just carpet bomb the entire place. Mm. You know. Let's eliminate the problem sort of thing. Well, I'm, I've just, of I've course, just quickly gone onto YouTube. They make the money from it. And found a Ron Paul discusses cannabis on Fox News. So I haven't checked it out. Yeah. Really unprepared, as usual. So but let's I'm hope gonna, he doesn't go into a tirade. Let's hope he doesn't, yeah, because then it really messes yeah. up the show, doesn't it? So know. I'm going to play this now anyway. Um, in, in the mean, And I'll get Peter Reynolds on the phone. Um, so is he a relation is, of Burt? Burt Reynolds? No? I don't think so. No. Oh, no, it's a shame. So. Right, I'm going to play this Ron Paul clip and uh, we'll get Peter Reynolds on the phone. James, you may have to waffle because it's only two minutes. Waffle, waffle, waffle. Okay, here we go. 
here's a question for you. Should people be able to smoke marijuana in the United States legally as long as they're doing it responsibly, kind of like with alcohol? Well, there is a new push by lawmakers to legalize the illegal drug for users, not abusers. A new proposal been announced in Congress to end federal penalties for anybody who's carrying fewer than 100 grams of pot. It's about three and a half ounces or so. Let's talk about it with one of the proposal supporters, Republican congressman from Texas, Ron Paul. Uh, also, you know him from the race for president. Congressman, good to see you. Uh, as your colleague Barney Frank said, the chances of this thing passing are not high, if you get the joke. Uh, <laughs> what's the aim here if this thing isn't going to pass? Well, my aim is always to promote freedom and the Constitution. And an issue like this is just uh, has no value uh, to have the federal police going out and trying to find people who might be smoking. Uh, before 1938, the federal government wasn't even involved. So uh, I would think that uh, the states can handle things like please. this. And, Stay tuned. Uh, the whole notion that we regulate and uh, uh, prosecute people for things that some other people think is a vice, uh, I just don't see any purpose on this. I thought we learned our lesson about what uh, prohibition did in the, in the early part of the last century. It, 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 there's no value to it. It wastes a lot of money and causes a lot of trouble. And what do we do? We end up with laws like this that prohibit sick people from using marijuana where they can get benefit, we literally, the federal government, override state laws and arrest people who are sick and getting some benefit from marijuana and they're dying with cancer or AIDS. It makes no sense at all. Congressman Paul, real quickly though, where does it end? So we legalize about three and a half ounces of pot, then we say, you know, if you've got a touch of crack cocaine, that's okay too. Well, that isn't the purpose of this piece of legislation, but, you know, for 130 years, that's exactly what happened. When I was a kid in high school selling uh, in a drugstore, I sold uh, cough medicine with codeine in it, and nobody recorded anything. And I never saw one kid in the whole, whole community ever abuse it. So this whole idea that you have to have the federal government make people do the right thing is total nonsense. Yes, it's dangerous. It's risky. But so is alcohol. And so is smoking cigarettes. It's who should do the policing and who should make these choices. And I say it should not be the federal government. It should be the parents and the individuals. And as long as they're not hurting other people, we should allow state regulations to take care of these problems. Well, there's Ron Paul's stance on it, and us, you know, people to make their own choices, really, yep. and allowed to make their own choices. So, after a few technical difficulties, we're going to hopefully have Peter here. Peter, can you hear us? Just about. Oh, how are you doing this morning? I'm fine, thank you. I'm fine. Good. Um, I've got James in the studio here Hello, with Peter. me. Hello, Peter. Hello. I gather you've got Lord Buffy of Tottenham there as well. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, we have... Uh, yeah, we I have, heard he was there. Yeah, we, yeah. Have, we, have, we have Chris in with us He's, as he's well. actually sat about three foot higher than us. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, Lord, be, lording it over us. Yeah. He would be. He keeps right. pelting us with the rice. Yeah, he's well right. behaved yourself as they'll take you down Tottenham Castle afterwards and dangle you off the rampart. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't mind that, actually. So, Peter, just just to start with, can, can you give us a little bit of a background on yourself and how you got involved with CLEAR? Uh, OK, well, um, uh, I suppose that starts, uh, with, uh, starts about 40 years ago in a little town called Chorleywood in Hertfordshire. That's where I'm from. It's not really, is it? I'm from Hart... Well, I'm from Watford, but oh, right, Chorleywood so was an old stomping ground, yeah. Um, but anyway, start there when I was 14 years of age. And, oh, we've uh, lost you. Can you hear him? OK. Yeah. Oh, it's my mic. OK, carry on. Sorry. Yes, I was 14 years of age, on my way home from school, met my best mate, John Pooler, at the end of the path that goes down to his house. And he said, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. And he held up this little black lump about the size of the top drawers of my thumb. Packy black, quid deal. It was an eighth of an ounce in those days. So we went back to his, his place, uh, up to his bedroom, and rolled ourselves up a spliff, probably on a Bob Dylan LP or something. Um, and I can vividly remember being sick in my coffee cup immediately afterwards. But that was my introduction to cannabis. And um, I, you know, my, my confession, if you like, is that virtually, virtually every day of my life since then, so 40 years, uh, I've, I've smoked cannabis. Um, it's never been anything but a positive force in my life. Um, but recently, I mean, I've, I've sort of campaigned on it on and off for many, many years. Um, I, re I wrote a report to the Home Affairs Select Committee as far back as 1983. Um, but about five years ago, I, I began to become aware of the, the, the increasing tide of evidence about its medicinal benefits. Right. Um, 
which really is, is quite overwhelming now, quite, quite overwhelming. I mean, it, cannabis, science now proves that cannabis is as, as close to a panacea as anything else that exists in medicine. Um, and this really struck me um, and sort of fired my enthusiasm. Um, then I met a few people who were using cannabis medicinally, and I recognized the absolutely transformational effect it has on their lives. Um, so, so much as I've always been outraged by the fact that my personal freedom is inhibited by prohibition, um, here I came across something which is, which is fundamentally evil, and that is that people who need cannabis as medicine, who, whom it can release from pain, suffering, and disability, are, are prevented from access to it, and indeed if they do get access to it, they risk being thrown in jail. So, so that is a cause that I believe is worth fighting for, and that's why I'm talking to you now. Great. Well, we've just been um, listening to a Ron Paul clip and his stance on it that, you know, let the people make their own decisions with regards to this. But I know in, there's ver a number of states in America where it actually has been legalised for medicinal purposes yeah, and there are, uh, like, superstores over there, aren't there? Well, I don't know about superstores. Well, there's legal dispensaries. dispensaries but um, yeah. the Obama administration has been cracking down, I know, in California. Um, even the, the legal, lawful... Yeah. Um, dispensaries for medical marijuana. They've actually yeah, been sending in. It's quite incredible what's going on over there. I they've mean, been now, sending in SWAT teams and everything. They're in California and they're now starting to crack down on the Colorado dispensaries, which actually are run on a much more strict basis and, and which I think they, they thought they were going to be safe. But the extraordinary thing is that Obama, when he came in, um, was very clear about the fact that if states had decided to regulate the availability of medical marijuana, then he wasn't going to interfere. Mm -hmm. But he's done a complete about turn on it. Um, he refuses to answer any questions on it. Um, it. It consistently tops the poll in all these sort of what they call online town hall meetings where, mm -hmm. where, where people are allowed to put in questions. It can, the question consistently tops the poll and it consistently gets ignored. Mm -hmm. And I think that shines a light on the fact that there is dishonesty, corruption, and... Um, the falsehood behind the, behind this continuing prohibition. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, because there is so little grounds for the prohibition in the first place, they yeah. just they're just getting more and more tyrannical and making sure that you don't have access to it. Because you know, so many people the the the, the fear factor of cannabis is long gone. Yeah, and and there's very few of the myths left that still sort of permeate that it's dangerous or something. You know, Pete, reefer madness is. Yeah, that's true. Just funny to. Peter, watch. you'll probably know more on the stats um, with regards to death caused by marijuana as opposed to the deaths caused by prescribed medications. Well, there are no deaths caused by marijuana. Right and now. about three hundred thousand a year. Um, that I believe in the states, it's something like three and a half million people a year die from prescribed medicines that have been taken properly in accordance with the prescription but nevertheless cause death. Um, I'm not sure what the alcohol figures are in the States. Um, in, in, in this country, uh, I mean, we, and the figure varies on exactly how you define it, but I mean, it's somewhere between about 8 and about 28,000 people die every year directly attributable to alcohol. Yeah. And something like, I think, uh, four or five times as many of that, as that die directly as a result of, of tobacco. Yeah. And it's incredible, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Incredible. So, uh, about Clear then, how long's Clear been, been set up? How well, clear, been clear, is, clear, clear was formerly called the Legalised Cannabis Alliance. Right. Um, which was founded in 1999 um, and uh, fielded a number of candidates in local and parliamentary elections. Um, and... Uh, really, I suppose, without, without being too unkind, came to a bit of a grinding halt. Um, in 2003, when cannabis was downgraded to, to a Class C drug, I think the general feeling was, was that the battle was over, that, 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 that we were in, in moving uh, on a path which, which was going to lead to eventual legalization. But as you'll be aware, in 2008, when Gordon Brown was... Um, became our appointed Prime Minister, not elected, appointed Prime Minister, he famously did a deal with Paul Dacre, the most dangerous man in Fleet Street, um, and agreed with Paul Dacre that in return for the Daily Mail's support for him as Prime Minister, he would reclassify cannabis to Class B, uh, directly against the advice of the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs. And then, of course, Gordon Brown met, stood up and made this absolutely astonishing speech in which he said, skunk is lethal. 
Um, and from that moment on, things started getting... Reefer, Reefer Madness version 2 mm -hmm. started. Um, the Daily Mail started writing a torrent of articles alleging that cannabis causes psychosis. Um, and things went rapidly downhill. Now, in, uh, what, 2010, I suppose, I, I became really involved in the campaign. Um, and uh, towards the uh, end of 2010, I, I, I was appointed as a spokesman for the Legalized Cannabis Alliance. Um, then in early 2011, there was a leadership election uh, in which I stood. Uh, I was elected as leader um, on the basis that we would re-register as a political party. Um, I am an ad man by trade. Um, and it was very clear to me that what the campaign needed was putting on a professional level with a professional identity, a professional strategy, and, you know, just doing the thing in a, in a sort of half-organized way. Um, so, again, we put it out to the membership. They voted to change the name, and we became known as Cannabis Law Reform, or CLEAR for short. Um, and you're an then, official political party now, are we're you? We're an officially registered UK political party. Great, OK. So um, there's been there's there's been a lot of controversy since I put out that you're on the show. Yeah. Um, various comments coming in via the radio Lou Collins radio show Facebook page. Um, some that just aren't really worth really worth aren't going into. But I've got just got one question here from somebody called Mark um, has asked about the the medicine wheel project. What's what is the medicine wheel project? Uh, the Medicine Wheel Project is an American company that is involved in um, uh, a number of uh, projects, I believe, um, one of which is growing tomatoes on the vine in massive greenhouses, and, and they've put a proposal to the UK government um, for a medical marijuana uh, industry, uh, which they have said would produce up to 100,000 new jobs. Um, it's uh, an, an admirable proposition. Um, I don't, in all honesty, hold out a great deal of hope um, for it getting anywhere. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, it, 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 it's another uh, <laughs> blow against prohibition. Yeah. Um, another one here. Um, does Clear support policies which would allow medicinal cannabis users to grow their own medicine? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I mean, we, we, you know, there's, there's two schools of thought here. Um, and uh, the, the, the older school of thought, if you like, is um, that uh, cannabis should be treated like tomatoes or carrots. Mm -hmm. And there should be no restrictions on it. You should be able to grow it where and when you want and do with it what you want. Now, you know, personally, I, that would suit me absolutely down to the ground. But uh, I'm here, um, and clear is here, to, 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 to make, take practical steps towards achieving change. And, you know, the idea that in Britain today, or even in the foreseeable future, cannabis is going to be treated like carrots or treated like tomatoes is, 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 is a futile dream, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. um, so so what, 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 what we have proposed is, is a regulated system. And this is quite right too, because you know, particularly with the, 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 the expertise that has developed in recent years for growing more and more potent varieties of cannabis, um, it does present dangers, particularly to young people. And I think it is right that it should be properly regulated. Um, but yes, we, we, we'd certainly like to be able to see people being able to grow a few plants for their own use, particularly for their medicinal users. And in fact, the law is already moving in that direction, um, because with the new Sentencing Council guidelines that came out um, last month, that came into force at the end of February, um, growing nine plants or fewer is now being treated very leniently. Um, it should, it should, if it's the first offence, it will probably result in a discharge or, or a low-level fine, but I think I think the point is that uh, anyone who chooses to do this, well, whether it's you know for whether it's choice for recreational use or whether they need it, what they need to do is they need to be discreet about it and they need to be responsible about it, yeah. um, and recognise that the law is now showing some tolerance, but some um, to you know, abuse it, that it, would be it, would just send it back, wouldn't it? Sorry, it, to abuse that exactly. would, would just send that, it completely yeah, backwards. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, we've also just been talking about um, the amount of, with regards to um, the troops and, and the wars that are going on in the world at the moment, and the fact with the opium fields over in Afghanistan, it, 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 it appears the American troops are actually staying there for one reason and one reason only, is to 
is to protect the, the the poppy fields over there and that the rate of the the opium um, and heroin coming into the countries has jumped up do you do you know much about that peter well i mean obviously we're moving on to the wider question yeah. of the war on drugs in That's general right. here now and i mean i do think cannabis is a particularly special case um principally because it has some because it's relatively harmless uh, and because it has such massive therapeutic applications but i mean in terms of afghanistan i mean Again, this shines a light on, on the, the corruption yeah. that, that is behind the war on drugs. You know, when, when we went into Afghanistan, the annual opium production was about 180 tonnes. It's now in excess of 5,000 tonnes. And yet the war was advanced as a reason. The war was one of the reasons for the war was to apparently to bring the opium trade under control. Well, it is under control now. Uh, yeah, well under control. <laughs> So, you know, it, it's an absurdity. And, I mean, there is no, there is no doubt about it that in terms of the op- opiates and cocaine, there is corruption at the very highest level. And when I say the very highest level, I'm talking world leaders. Mm-hmm. You know, there are people who are lining their pockets with billions of dollars um, and, and permitting the, the trade to go on. You know, the people who... Uh, the only people who support prohibition are governments and drug dealers, mm-hmm. uh, which is an extraordinary thing. Um, <clears throat> Peter, this is an email in from uh, Cassie, and uh, she says the greatest danger to the cause of uh, medic- uh, medicinal cannabis at this time is not from the laws of government policies, uh, as they're changing, but from commercialization, um, namely by the corporations and big pharma that is that they're doing quite a lot of synthetic yeah. um, versions and variants of, of, of the plant. Um, I, I know there's a big one in the States now that they're pushing, which is artificial. Okay. Um, is that Marinol? Mar- Marinol is synthetic THC. Yeah. yeah. So um, do you see much of a, a push from the big pharma to basically, because uh, I'm very much uh, pro-health freedom, um, and I'm really against, just the last couple of years, really against all the chemicals and everything that they're putting in our food, Definitely. spraying on our crops. And I have a fear that they'll sort of allow cannabis to uh, be taken as long as it's from Big Pharma, in which case, pretty much, if you're looking at something synthetic, yeah, I think, it, you know, what sort of moves are there to make sure that, you know, legalization is going towards the natural plant and it not being, it, it being legal simply because it's coming from Big Pharma, which we already know. Well, I, I mean, I think, you know, that's a hugely complex question. Um... I think there are moves afoot to do that. I mean, you know, cannabis is available on prescription in Britain today. Mm-hmm. It's called Sativex. Um, and it costs, or the NHS gets charged for it, ten times what organized crime sells cannabis for on the streets. Mm-hmm. Um, which is just simply astonishing. You know, the, the, the other thing is, the only reason that, that Sativex has been able to obtain a license from the government is basically because it was a confidence trick. Mm-hmm. Um, it was presented and is still presented as being an extract of just two particular components of cannabis. But this is blatantly untrue. It is an whole plant extract. And I mean, that, you know, GW Farm and the manufacturers will confirm that. You can find it on their website. Right. Um, but I mean, there's all sorts of misinformation going around about it. Like the idea, for instance, that it doesn't get you high. Well, right. Believe me, it gets you high. <laughs> I can tell you that because I've tried it. And I think uh, Lord Bobby can probably confirm that as well from his own experience. Um, um, it, it, it is cannabis. It's a liquefied form of cannabis. Um, is that similar to um, the... Uh, I know I was reading studies, um, I, I think it was Canada that did a big t- uh, study a year or so back about cannabis oil with curing cancer. Cannabis is essentially cannabis oil. Right, so it is a cannabis oil then. Yeah. So is is it right that it actually does this, you know, um, the same to a tumour as that what it, it the effects that it has on 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 us? No, I think you know, you've got I think you've got to be very very yeah. careful about all this business about cannabis and cannabis. Well, this is why we've got you on, so we can we can discuss this. Uh, well, I mean, I mean, you know, for, there, there are studies that show that if you inject THC directly into the tumours in the brain of mice, then it shrinks the tumours. Right. Okay. Okay. Now there's an awfully big jump between that and saying that cannabis cures cancer. Right. Um, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence. Um, there is, as far as I'm concerned, um, absolutely credible proof that cannabis oil cures skin cancer. 
there's a firm in the States, Cannabis Science, who, who, who are now developing therapies in that area. But we're an awful long way from being able to say in, in uh, absolute terms, you know, in the same way as you can say that if you take ranitidine, it will, it will, it will um, calm the acid production down in the stomach. You can say that absolutely, up with absolute confidence. We're a long way from being able to say these same things about cannabis and cancer. But it's an enormously promising area of research, and the present law inhibits that research. Mm-hmm. Right. But there are, I mean, there are the downsides. It's schizophrenia, I think, with some of them. Um, it can cause... Um, where are we? I had all this up. Just, uh, yeah, well, there, there, really there are, there is the, the dangers. Studies of, of but, heavy cannabis marijuana use cause anxiety, mental health disorders such as paranoia, depression, insomnia, schizophrenia, and even uh, a motivational syndrome, which relates to a lack of ambition or drive. Yeah. Well, you know, if, if somebody sits around smoking weed all day long, um, then I think it probably does uh, reduce their drive, you know? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the difficulties here is that, of course, the, the age at which um, people historically have, have started smoking cannabis is in their teens. And this is also the same age as when people start going through all those sort of adolescent issues about can't get out of bed in the morning, etc. and the two things tend to get combined together. But, you know, cannabis is a psychoactive substance. Mm-hmm. That, that's why people take it. So, 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 I mean, to suggest that, it, that it's not possible to cause any psycho- psychological difference, difficulties would be nonsense. Of course it is. Well, yeah. let's, let's be honest. If you drink too much diet soda or too much pop or whatever, the, you're, you're going to have... Yeah. I exactly. mean, a lot of these studies, they say, oh, well, it's been linked to this. But it's, what my argument is, well, a lot of things have been linked to a lot of things. And you only ever hear about, you know, cannabis. Yeah. You won't you won't see anything about, you know, aspartame. Is that aspartame? Causing, you know. And also the chem, you know, I, I, you know, this morning driving here, it's a gorgeous sunny day here, down here in Devon. And the skies are again being filled with the chemtrails and what's that doing to us? But the government have approved this, that this can go on. I but, thought you were joking when we talked about that earlier. No, no, I wasn't joking at all. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> you have to listen into another show, Peter, when we'll be right. discussing it. <laughs> um, I think we've got another question here. Um, OK, a uh, medicinal cannabis cannabis user and campaigner used to run an organisation called Humidi, Humidi, where they mailed out free medical cannab- cannabis sticks to people. Um... Legisl- um, Peter has proposed legislation which is unworkable for many medicinal users. Um, does he want to limit the amount of plants, limit the power lights, um, or give police more power to enter properties? Well, I, I mean, I, I, what, I want to, what I want to do is propose a system of regulation that will encourage government to relax the law. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is what I mean, you see. It's a completely foolhardy position to think that the government is suddenly going to reverse its position and say you can do what you want. Mm-hmm. So therefore, in order to encourage them along the line to wa- along the path towards legalisation, what I believe we need to do is show how we can be responsible mm-hmm. by saying we will limit ourselves to growing six plants or a dozen plants, or we will limit ourselves to a certain lumens output or what output from the lighting we're using. Mm-hmm. Um, and by... by showing how we can be responsible, more responsible than, than, if you like, the evidence suggests we need to be, but nevertheless, if we can put this forward as an offer, that it will encourage government to, to, to move in that direction. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's uh, it's the same with everything. With, with a lot of campaigners, of course, you get very passionate about things, but there is a, there is a very uh, firm stranglehold on society right now, and uh, you're not going to suddenly overturn that overnight. So I guess exactly making I mean, realistic there is goals is not in the cannabis campaign about this issue, mm-hmm. and it's something that has gone on forever. It's mm-hmm. throughout the whole history of the campaign, because there are there are people who, as I said earlier, believe cannabis should be treated like tomatoes, and I agree with them. Mm-hmm. You know, I would love that to be the case, but it ain't going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so so it's all very well standing on these noble principles and. And, and saying that, you know, this guy, Peter Reynolds, comes along and wants to restrict us to a certain number of plants and restrict the amount of light we can use and everything, and, you know, he's just as bad as the others. Well, you know, I'm sorry, but what I'm here for is about practical change. 
Um, not, not sticking to stubborn, obstinate positions, but creating practical change that means that people who need cannabis as medicine will have access to it. Yeah. So what's, what's the way forward then, Peter? Well, I, I mean, we, we are, we, I believe, you know, we've got reason to be very optimistic at the moment because um, we have a Home Affairs Select Committee inquiry into drugs policy. It started in February, um, and it's, uh, nobody knows when it's going to finish, but I mean, my, my guess would be that it won't be until probably the autumn even that we'll get a report from them. Uh, we have done a great deal of work to organise a lot of submissions from our members. Um, I know there's a tremendous amount of submissions gone into them. I know there's been a lot of very powerful, coherent arguments put. Um, and I think we've got a great deal of cause to be optimistic about what the outcome will be. Um, now, in fact, I'll go further than that. I will, I will say that within the lifetime of this Parliament, so that's by 2015, I believe that we will have in Britain some form of medicinal use. Whether it will go further than that, uh, I really don't know. And I think whether, whether it goes further than that is really down to America, to what happens in the US. Because wasn't it recently that um, one, of the, one of the only real reasons that they had to keep prohibition open was they were saying, well, it's the health effects of inhalation from smoking it. Um, they said that was a danger. And then wasn't there a study very recently that, that pretty much disproved that as well? The American Medi in the American Medical Association Journal, that's right. There was another study back in 2006 by a chap called Dr. Don Donald Tashkin uh, at University College Los Angeles, um, who, who, who started his study um, believing that cannabis would prove much would, would prove to be the cause of lung cancer uh, and emphysema or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Mm -hmm. He started very much from that point of view, and he himself was astonished at the results of his research because what he found was that people who smoke cannabis neat without any tobacco mm -hmm. actually develop less C COPD and fewer cancers than people who smoke nothing at all. Mm -hmm. And what he concluded as a result of his study was that cannabis actually provides a protective effect for the lungs against cancer and against COPD. Um, and as you correctly say, this study's just been reconfirmed by another study mm -hmm. in America. But I mean, that's not, you know, the prohibitionists will leap, will jump from one argument to another. Let yeah. me tell you that the two main reasons cannabis remains illegal or, 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 or the possession and cultivation of cannabis remains illegal in Britain is number one, the Daily Mail, and number two, the Americans. Mm -hmm. There's a there was a really good documentary that I watched recently. I think it was um, Mar Marijuana: The Truth, and uh, that goes into even how how um, they pushed for prohibition in the first place yeah. by using the Mexican term marijuana instead of cannabis. Yeah. Um, because the Americans were farming and cultivating cannabis yeah. since the inception, and and sort of it was it was all a sort of con job then basically to to make something illegal that a large part part of the population you know used not just for you know the recreational but for medicines yeah. for uh, um, textiles yeah uh, fuel yeah. I think Ford didn't Ford have a car that was running on on um, hemp and cannabis oils uh, so I mean the, the, the amount of the amount of uh, uses that they were, that were making out of this to, to come out of it yeah and uh, I think it was the Hearst dynasty and um, that's right and the big oil right, tycoons yeah. Was, Hearst, yeah, the, yeah. The chemical company it, it was this sort of uh, it was basically this con job quite cleverly done to make something you know widely used mm. and not causing any problems to, to be suddenly become illegal and then this creation of uh of myth afterwards you know to, to link mm. it in as it uh, the one when i was growing up it was a gateway drug oh you start you know that's you yeah, smoke, yeah 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 it leads to other things down the street and yeah. inject some heroin and yeah you know um but that's 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 the that's it's, it's how it's that's how yeah, it's packaged it's over it's here. Myth, myth that's that's the same that's the same stance yeah. as that. I mean, I was I mean, you know, what is the gateway is illegality. You know, yeah. I mean, it is true that you know if, if you're buying cannabis off somebody, he is quite likely to offer you something else as well. Yeah. 
But then that, if it was legalised, that would stamp all that out. Exactly. I mean, what we advocate is a regulated system of supply where it will be available through licensed outlets to adults only. And if you wanted to buy cannabis, you didn't, and then there was any doubt about your age, then you'd have to produce ID just as you do for alcohol or cigarettes now. You know, mm-hmm. We're not suggesting it would be perfect. We're not suggesting it would eliminate all underage use, but it would be a damn sight better than what we've got now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just going, touching on another subject, your book. Yeah. You've got a book out. Um, the Games. Is it London, London Games? Games? London Games. So um, what inspired you to write it, Peter? Uh, I wanted to make myself a fortune and become, you know, a best-selling novelist. Oh, did you? OK. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I've been a writer all my life. Um, and I was an advertising copywriter to start with. I, I have written... Well, I say I've written one novel before. The truth of the matter is I wrote half of it and never finished it. But it's sort of the, in terms of the emotional space in my life, that was the first one and this is the second one. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm... Uh, inspired by the idea of the Olympics. I mean, again, I think there's a great deal of corruption and, and uh, untruth around it as well. Um, but uh, I, I think it's, uh, it will be a wonderful occasion. I'm great, greatly looking forward to it. And um, my book takes place in the run-up to the Olympics. It's um, autobiographical in many senses. It covers many issues and many experiences I've had in my life. And it ends at the moment when the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games starts. Mm. There's been a lot of um, a lot of debate, but certainly, you know, in, in the the show that we're putting on and the people it's reaching, um, there is a lot of talk that it's going to be a prime opportunity for some false flag event um, by the government to instil more, you know, to to bring in more more laws with regards to Big Brother watching us, um, and obviously more illegal wars to enter into. Um, and it's apparently it's focusing around sort of like the closing the closing time that there will be some some sort of a false flag event. Um, I know that the government are spending absolutely millions with um, surface to air missiles. I think yeah. to, to, well, to those, pre- those to, flying Arab terrorists. Yeah, well, yeah. I, think, you know, I think it's very difficult to very very difficult to to come up with a sort of truthful analysis of what goes on in these situations. I mean, I live in Weymouth or just outside Weymouth, where the um, sailing event is taking place and the chaos that this town has been through for the last two years and is still going through now in terms of um, development for for the olympics uh, for you know what, what is a tiny minority sport is probably the worst spectator sport you can think of yeah um and yet they have completely destroyed our town the roadworks around it have been so bad that the town centre has been completely abandoned. Is that for, to do with that, or is it to do with the... Because every single town, it appears... James and I had to go down to Plymouth last week, mm. and every single turning we took, roads were being dig, dug up, and there was a mention that it was something to do with the old smart meters that we're getting in over here, the, the, the roadworks. So well, I don't I know, know if, if the town's being dragged up for that or something to do with the Olympics. Well, for instance, for instance in Weymouth, where, where we had a whole series of roundabouts... Which are, which are recognised internationally now as the most progressive way to control traffic at junctions, they've taken out all the roundabouts in Weymouth and put traffic lights in. Um, I think on the basis that when, when, you know, this, when the, all this massive Olympic traffic arrives, if it ever does, they'll just be able to switch all the lights to green in one direction mm. and, and, and keep everybody else waiting. Um, but uh, as I say, I mean, it's destroyed the town. Every Olympics since since time began, as far as I know, has lost money. Mm. Um, so, so you know, quite. What, what, you know, I mean, I don't want to run down. I don't want to be negative about the fantastic sporting achievements. No, no, of course. Be, you know, um, but 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 the sort of business around it uh, is a poor. I mean, you know, another thing. I mean, when, when, many years ago, I used to be a very keen shotgun shooter. I used to shoot at quite a high level in clay pigeon shooting. Okay, it, the, 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 what they're doing with the clay pigeon sh- shooting in the Olympics is they're spending ten million pounds on on putting together a temporary venue in Greenwich. My God! Well, while, ha- while food packages are being handed out, sort of like say, let's in Oakhampton by the Salvation Army to feed people, we could we could we can spend that money exactly, on clay. But, but, but I mean, that, that, that's the uh. point. But I mean, the point I was going to make was that. Just down the road, 20 miles outside London is Bisley, which has been the home of shooting 
for 100 years, which if they'd given them the £10 million, would have left a genuine legacy. Yeah. Where there's not going to be any legacy at all from the money they're wasting here. No. Of course not. It's, they're, it's pros just, at, they're pros at wasting money in government. They are. They That's are really. Saying. They're so good at it. Exactly. Uh, I mean, going back to the cannabis issue, the yeah. one issue we haven't covered yet is the money issue. Yeah. Um, and we commissioned independent... This is, this is another good example of, of what I of what I wanted Clear to be and what I believe Clear has become. Uh, we, we went out last year and we commissioned independent expert research to establish what the facts are about cannabis in Britain. Mm. And we now know uh, that the, if, if cannabis was, was subjected to a tax and regulate regime, it would produce a net gain to the UK economy of somewhere between six and nine billion pounds per year. And do you know how much money we spend in policing for cannabis? Half a billion pounds a year. Yeah, so. Criminal justice costs for cannabis alone, that's, you know, pr that's, that's police, prisons, probation service, it's, uh, in the courts, etc., 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 500 million pounds oh, for cannabis alone. Whoa. It's crazy. Yeah. Absolutely madness. It, absolute madness. And, and, just... and, you know, this is all against, supposedly... Uh, you know, the, the, the big the health issue that is mentioned, as we've already touched on, is psychosis. Mm -hmm. You know, the facts are that there are approximately 750 people admitted to hospital each year in Britain for mental or behavioural orders related to cannabis. Mm -hmm. 750 people. Tragedy for every single one of those Definitely. 750 people. But there are approximately 3,000 people admitted to hospital every year for peanuts. Yeah. yeah, well, I've got I've got a peanut allergy. I'll well, and, and yeah. also yeah. I'd like to and the amount of alcohol. I mean, that's weekly. How many people yeah. end up in A and E after drinking too much? It's the, the a lot of the the links are extremely dubious as well because what you'll get is that's one of the questions that you'll go into hospital for something and they'll say, oh, "Have you been, you know, on, on cannabis?" And oh, oh, he has, and he's got psychosis. It yeah. doesn't mean it's a different... I mean, you could be a nut job and just had a spliff. And, you know, it's not going to have caused it. It's just, you know... But they, they're scraping for... for. I have a friend that got rehypnoled once and we went to the hospital to say, you know, to say, can you test us to see if, if she's got the, the drug in her system? And after waiting for three or four hours, the doctor finally came and said, oh, well, what do you expect me to do about it? And we're like, well, we want to know if she's been drugged or not because, you know, obviously it's very serious yeah. to be to be drugged and uh, they said well no all we could do is tell you if you were drugged or not and we don't get funding for that but we will test you for cannabis if you want <gasps> and, I, and I thought wow I don't know anybody that's ever been raped on cannabis but no. thanks a lot but it's us. the same I mean the, the FDA and the, and the British Medical this Ritalin I mean I, I know I was talking to Ian Crane recently and apparently you get £600 per if you take your doctor your child to the doctor um, say with behavioural problems they're yeah. hyperactive if you get prescribed Ritalin and you're on income support or you're on job seekers allowance um, for a reward for you for putting your child on Ritalin to dumb the child down mm. and to take away who that person is because yeah. effectively that's what it does they get 600 pounds per child and if you've got three children and you get all three children onto the ritalin you get a car wow at the end of it so i need to look more into this this is just pushing. what i've you yeah. know this is what has been made aware by various people has been brought up to me it, it but then if you're walking down the road and you're smoking a joint you're going to get stopped by the police and classes what have you but in the se and then we're told we have to we need to be dumbing our kids down well it just depends on who's pushing the drugs i think well yeah, it's the same the thing do. isn't it That's yeah i mean you know another astonishing thing about sativex about gw pharmaceuticals you know the, the, uh, the, the, this incredibly strong concentrated version of cannabis you know if cannabis causes psychosis why isn't there a label on the Sativex bottle warning you of this. Mm -hmm. mm. There isn't. No. Yeah, I think a lot of it is just, uh, they're just um, s stretching to find, find reasons to keep it illegal. Like I said earlier, the amount of people that are now okay with it. I remember growing up, it was still quite a stigma about it, of course. Um, and nowadays it's not because a lot of people have tried it. A lot of people haven't gone mental. No. I, I know personally a lot of people... I mean, everything has to be done within... Well, of course. Within the but certain... I know, a lot, I, lo I know a lot more people with drinking problems, and I like a good drink myself, but, I mean, I know a lot of people that have serious problems with that. Well, I was saying as first hand, and, and the, the violence that goes with the, the, the aggression as well that goes with people with too much alcohol. addictive personality that you can get addicted or... Exactly. Uh, you can have abuse 
from anything. You can exactly. have abuse from substances. You can have behavioural res- abuse. Responsibility, yeah. isn't it? So, I mean, at the end of the day, we need to have responsibility for ourselves and for our families. People need to get back into looking out for each other. And as also well. thinking for themselves as yeah. well, you know, because we're, we're getting the government telling us so much on what we, what we are to do and how we should be living our lives and yeah. everything else. When at the end of the day, we're human beings, all of us, yeah. and we have a right to sort of freedom and to making errors and mistakes, and that's yeah. how we learn from that's them. That's right, absolutely, that's right. And I mean, your mankind, the latest archaeological evidence is that mankind has been using cannabis for 27,000 years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and if, frankly, if there was anything that, if it was, if it was seriously dangerous, um, then it. I think we'd have found out by now. Yeah. It's like the um, the Native Americans with their po- 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 peyote, peyote yeah. yeah plants. We went in and we destroyed all those, and that was that was something that was used as almost like religiously over there. It took them, to, you know, to their spirituality. It was part of who they are. Absolutely. And you know, they they were destroyed. I know in some countries they have special centres for it, and but they. If you, if you want a peyote cactus now, I think you can get them in Tottenham. You just have to ask Lord Bovey. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that after the show. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, that's that's your area james that's fine you can you can go and ask away what, cacti yeah. Well, yeah i'm all about the cacti <laughs> peter before oh, okay. before we before we go i'm there has been a lot of talk about a very controversial blog that you had written yeah. a while back do you want to clear all this this up for us it, without me going through the nasty the nasty details of what people may have been saying uh, well, I mean, basically, it's quite simple. I mean, I, you know, as I said, I've been a writer all my life. Uh, for about three or four years before I was elected as leader of Clare, um, I was writing a, a, a blog on all, all sorts of political issues. Um, and uh, as a result of my election, various people with very strange motivations have gone back through, through my blog, so something like nearly 500 articles on that, um, and they've picked out three or four of them and, and chosen to try and manipulate and distort these into, and paint me as being racist, homophobic, um, anti-Muslim, anti-Jewish, um, I mean, bites babies' heads off for breakfast every morning, um, enjoys perverted sex with rhinoceroses. I mean, you know, w- w- you know apparently I used to sell Nazi memorabilia on a Swansea market stall. Um, I mean, it's extraordinary. Mm. Um, uh, the, the whole experience has been a real eye-opener for me, is, is that when you put yourself up um, to make a stand about something, how people, even those people who, who you think are on your side, yeah. will do everything they possibly can to knock you down. Yeah, um, but when you're really you're, you're working for maybe the greater good, really, to try and well, to make I'm change. I'm not doing it for myself, no. I can tell you that. I mean, I mean, there's been all sorts of allegations about me making money out of it which is the most laughable thing in the world. Uh, believe me, doing this costs me money every single day. Mm. Um, but uh, it, it's simply astonishing. But, but the thing that is encouraging beyond this, although there's a, there's a very small number of, of, of people who are very vociferous in opposition to me, despite that, throughout all this, our membership has gone and continued to rise every single day. Uh, you know, there, there, there's, there is a campaign. In fact, there's actually a petition on the Internet to have me removed as leader. Well, in, in two or three months, they've managed to amass 200 signatures on this. Mm. Well, you know, we get 100 new registrations every week. So how many, how many members do you have with Clear? We've got it's a total of 10,000 registered supporters. That's nearly 1,000 fully paid up members and over 8,500 Facebook supporters. Hmm. Oh, that's, very, that's positive, Peter. That's really positive. Well, we're, unfortunately, Peter, we're out of time. Um, we, yeah, we'll, we'll bring you back on again, you know, in, in the future and just discuss things and hopefully, you know, the law will, and, uh, will go in your favour. OK, well, I'll have to go and find out about those chemtrails now. Please do, please do. Okay. And have a look at aspartame as well. Aspartame? Yes, Aspart- I'm afraid I've got a can of Coke Zero in front of me now. Oh. Uh, pour it down the sink, Peter. <laughs> I did read somewhere that before it became a, 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 sweet, a sweetener, it was a biochemical warfare agent. Yeah, and it's really? also used as pesticides in, in some countries as well. Oh, dear. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. That, that, Yummy. That's all there is to say. Aspartame cannabis. Hmm. Let's have <laughs> the a think cannabis on that is one. the only thing keeping his cell regeneration <laughs> going there. Absolutely. <laughs> Peter, thanks so much for your time today. That's my pleasure. Thank cheers. You Take care. Bye. Okay, cheers. Bye. Oh, that was all right, wasn't it? Yeah.
So, next week, they're doing building work here at Sound Art. All right. We've got... I've they're got, building that water slide that I said that they should... Possibly, I don't know. Um, Clive de Gaulle was going to come on and be our guest. Well, he is going to be our guest, because I think we... I think we should pre-record it. He's going to... I saw him talk at the Natural Health Federation conference up in Brick Lane that I was at a couple of weeks ago. Um, and he was fascinating, talking about all the benefits of collodial silver, um, getting back to... getting back to um, proper food, mm. na- you know, and natural health and he he was absolutely fascinating mm. so i'm really i'm really looking forward to so maybe we'll pre-record that show cuz i think and have it played out for next week tune in next week at yeah tune in for clive de Gaulle. i'm just um just going to get you his website up actually uh do if i can find it well we'll play out this play out song and then i can come back and just um give out clive's while website Google. while i google CIA. Yeah. No, not CIA. Go away. Thanks for having us. It's me and James and Chris has been sitting in with us. We're going to play this song when I get the links for um, Clive de Gaulle that we'll be playing out next week. Thanks for having me. See you later. Cheerio. Bye. Hi, it's, it's Lou again. Right, Clive... Um, Clive's website is ancientpurity.com and it's Cl- Clive de Carl. So have a look at ancientpurity.com and um, we're going we're gonna to pre-record that this week and then get it played out um, for the show next Monday. Thanks for joining me. Bye. Song and dance.